Welcome to the first episode of the PTSM podcast. My name is Terry Degani. I'm your host. Today, I'm very honored to have our very first guest, Jeremy Kendall. Welcome, Jeremy. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, it's uh, the honor's all mine, mate. Um, I've been very excited to talk about um, all things life with you. Obviously, you um, you have a very fascinating journey, and uh, I'm really keen to dive deep into into you, not just as a as an athlete, but really as a person. And that's really the intention of this is to really um, see you for who you are. And um, yeah, I, I should obviously ask off the bat. I can hear the little kids in the background. Talk to me a little bit about uh, what's happening in your world as we speak. Oh man. Uh... Nas, my wife, is just taking the boys to bed at the moment. They're taking a little nap. Um, now we have two um, six-month-old twins, um, Takoa Ace and Isaac and Joshua. And just, uh, yeah, it's our first, our first kids and um, just taking care of them, being able to spend a lot of time with them um, during this isolation has been very special for our family. Nas is first ever Mother's Day yesterday, so it's a pretty, uh, pretty special time. For, for us as a family, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think, obviously, you've you've committed your your life to your craft. But uh, when the family comes around, it's a whole new it's a whole new career in some sense. What what is the adjustment in that like been? Hey, you know, I think um, one uh, family is very important to me um, and my wife, and um, it certainly comes before uh, anything that we do career wise. Um, and I just think that, uh, you know, your family is going to be there for you, you know. And, the, for example, basketball, you know, if you're fortunate, you play 10 years professionally, 12 maybe. Um, you know, it's, it's here and it's gone in no time. Um, but your family really is a part of your foundation. And coming home to them after hard workouts and doing my ACL rehab, it's, uh, it's very, very easy to keep, you know, your perspective and, and stay, stay focused on what's important and prioritize. And I think you just got to get better at time management and, um, you know, being disciplined and, and planning well whenever you have a family. Cause, um, you know, once you start a family and get married, you know, it's not all about you anymore. So, uh, you got to learn to humble yourself and, and plan well. Yep, absolutely. And a shout out to Nas, as you mentioned, first mother's day, that's a very special achievement. Yeah, we tried the spoiler as best we could. Lots of chocolate, lots of cuddles. It was good. Yeah, that must do the trick. That must do the trick. And, and talk to me a little bit about the support system around you. Um, obviously, you've got immediate family now, but uh, what other support systems has your family been for you throughout your journey? Yeah, I mean, my parents have been phenomenal for me. They've believed in me and my dreams from day one. Um, you know, at the moment, we we decided to, to move to Brisbane. Neither of us have family here. Um, Nas's parents are in New Zealand. She's from Nelson, New Zealand. Mine are in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Um, but, you know, we, we stay in touch with them. We, we uh, FaceTime, uh, you know, once a week at least. And for, as me, for growing up, for me and my youth, like my parents sacrificed a lot so that I could play basketball, you know, go to the local camps, um, have the newest J's, like whatever it was that uh, made me feel significant and made me feel, um, you know, like they valued my basketball. Uh, they always took that extra step to sacrifice and, and work a bit harder for, for family. And I learned a lot from them and they really paved the way and they continue to support me to this day. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. I, I played basketball myself uh, my entire life uh, from the age of four. So I, I can relate to the support and traveling to those Friday night games and um, the meals that are paid for afterwards. It's, it's funny. You, don't, you almost don't appreciate it anywhere near as much as probably when you get a little bit older. And I guess in your case, once you start having kids as well and looking ahead, once they start playing sport, whatever it might be, um, you'll have to pass the baton down. Yeah, you know, hindsight is definitely twenty twenty, and hopefully I can be half the, the father that my dad has been for me. Um, and he also coached me growing up. So he coached me in the, the local YMCA leagues and the Jeffersonville Youth Basketball Leagues and AAU and all that. So he was a big inspiration for why I played, and hopefully I can uh, pass on my knowledge to my boys too. Yep, 
Fantastic. Well, let's talk a little bit about basketball and um, your career. And let me let's perhaps touch on the very beginning. Who were some of the early heroes? I know you have mentioned that Dad obviously put a ball in your hand from a young age, so there's obviously probably the first spark. But who were some of the heroes of yours growing up and inspirational figures? Um, definitely Michael Jordan, um, for sure, my favorite. Um, and when I first started watching basketball in the NBA, first started watching NBA basketball, it was actually, you know, Penny Hardaway was a, was a massive uh, influence for me, him and uh, Little Penny and the commercials and all that. So I uh, kind of grew up watching, you know, 90s NBA basketball. Um, but other than MJ and Penny, um, you know, Pistol Pete Maravich was another big one for me. Um, and I guess like Jason Williams, Steve Nash, Jason Kidd, any any uh, six two, six three, six four white boys that were in the NBA, I tried to to um, to follow and gain some inspiration from. And then also players like Russell Westbrook today and Steph Curry, uh, Chris Paul. Uh, there's there's a lot of guys that I try to learn from and try to emulate in one way or another. And um, learn from yep for sure uh, i've seen you mention uh and it's been well documented that you had a, a pretty solid growth spurt growing up and uh you yourself have described yourself as a perhaps a late bloomer uh, talk to me about that process of you know continuing to believe in yourself when perhaps the the external world coaches and the like uh perhaps maybe didn't have the same belief as you and how you overcame that yeah so i was always um, a bit shorter uh, a bit slower, a bit less athletic, um, and really just less mature than the kids my age and my grade. Um, all the way through about sophomore year in high school, I was actually told by the varsity head coach at Jeffersonville High School that I'd never play varsity basketball. Uh, I was about 15 years old. I was about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, you know, 140 pounds soaking wet with weights in my shoes. I was just super... I just looked very immature. Uh, I was just a late bloomer. And um, from my sophomore to junior year, I, I grew about uh, six inches. And I really worked on my game. And I was fortunate enough my sophomore year that the head JV coach knew my dad. They had a mutual respect through basketball. He kept me on the JV team. I rode the bench pretty much the whole season. I come back, you know, a few months later uh, through we have uh, – back then we had – after school, we had summer break, which was like three, four months, and you wouldn't see a lot of people. And so I had a huge growth spurt, and I came back my junior year, and I was like as tall as everybody, you know, uh, really just filled out with my body. And um, I, I started varsity my junior year, so I went from being told I'd never play varsity by the, the head varsity coach to, um, you know, him giving me a varsity starting spot the very, very next season. So it was a pretty uh, crazy um, year there for me. Yeah, I, I can't help but feel those sort of um, experiences are really what have helped you in your career as you've become an adult. Um, you know, learning, I guess, humility in a sense, but also having that inner drive to know your worth. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, that pain, those uh, disadvantages that you have maybe, those flaws or shortcomings – I think if you truly have a passion for something, you're just going to uh, find a way to make things work. You know, you're going to – I had to be really crafty with my footwork. I had to be really crafty with my ball fakes and how I deceived defenders with my eyes. You know, stuff like that I learned at a very, uh, I guess, uh, advanced level or uh, quick in pace because of how unathletic I was. So for me, it, it worked in my favor. Uh, and then once the athleticism started coming – um, everything just tied in really, really well together. But definitely uh, any type of pain or adversity, I think, uh, can really work to uh, an individual's favor if they're willing to keep uh, pushing through and not quit. Certainly, certainly. And, um, you know, your basketball has really, it's reached, it's reached levels that I'm not sure if you even imagined it would have, you know, playing in Australia, um, playing in some of the games that you've played in, uh, what are some of the, the moments perhaps that really stick into your mind throughout your career, whether it's on or off the court with the game? I think, um, you know, on the court, 
uh, at Bellarmine University my second year. We won a national championship. So that by far is probably uh, the best moment in my whole entire basketball career. Because anytime you win a, a championship, it's special at any level. Um, but especially in college because, you know, you do three or four years with most of those guys. You're doing two-a-days. You know, you're waking up at 5, 4.30 in the morning. And you're having a, a really disciplined, strict uh, college coach who loves you to death, you know, just getting the best out of you for two hours. And, you, you know, you, that blood, sweat, and tears with those college teammates is just different um, than any other level. And um, I think off the court, I think um, some big ones for me is, you know, starting my business, Jeremy Kendall Basketball, and being able to give back to the players in the community that I'm a part of. Um, and, um, really just helping out with the ministry hoops for Christ, which is uh, a basketball ministry where we use the game as a platform to share the gospel and give, uh, you know, kids hope and encourage them through basketball. And so those are some of my pretty cool moments winning championships and really serving people through my passion for basketball. I can only imagine through the camps and I guess working with, with the youth, that's really uh, prepared you for fatherhood. Hey, yeah, it has. Um, I mean, it's prepared me as about as good as, <laughs> as, uh, as it can. You know, it's still a humbling experience. Um, I'm learning a lot on the fly daily. Um, but no, certainly being the more you're around, uh, I think, youth and kids in particular, uh, and the more you're willing to humble yourself and, and help people in any way you can, I, I think that that just you grow into the next opportunity. And obviously uh, this past season was becoming a father. So that opportunity was amazing. And uh, it's definitely coaching kids and training players certainly has helped that. Yep, for sure. I want to turn the conversation to leadership. And uh, it's interesting because the players that you mentioned growing up who, you know, you really modeled your, your game style on, uh, they all have leadership qualities in their own right, obviously being point guards, generals of the floor, and they all have their own styles. Uh, talk to me about leadership and what it means to you and what your leadership style is. Yeah, I think, um, you know, people do what they see, you know. Um, so the best way to lead for sure is lead by example. Uh, you know, the old cliche saying, you know, um, actions speak louder than words. Um, and I think... Um, for me, being a believer, uh, I, I look at the verse, you know, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. So in other words, for me, I can also say, you know, words by themselves, if not accompanied by action, is dead. You know, those words are dead. So being able to back up, you know, what you're, what you're proclaiming and saying in your words, I think that's the, the ultimate uh, testament of a leader. And also, I think leadership, the hardest person to lead for me has been myself, you know, so I'm always looking at myself in the mirror and saying, you know, how can you evolve? How can you change? How can you grow? Uh, what can you modify to become better? How can you relate to people better? How can you connect with them better? How can you serve them better? And for me, it's a constant daily grind of leading myself. Um, and just hopefully on the way, you know, um, uh, I inspire people and teach them and motivate them and encourage them to be the best, you know, versions of themselves. But I think too, having good mentors, I've had tremendous coaches, um, tremendous teachers and mentors in my life, um, that have really, really believed in me. Um, and, uh, they've taken me under their wing. So having that mentorship, I think is absolutely imperative if you want to become a good leader. Yeah, Absolutely. And I mean, the, the, the theme was inspired by uh, The Last Dance. I've been uh, just caught up on episode uh, seven and eight. Um, and, you know, you know, Michael obviously talks a lot about his leadership style and uh, it's very it's very upfront. Uh, it's very much I'm going to prepare you for what's coming on the court in, in the heat of the battle. Uh, with you and your career, has your leadership style on the court, has it perhaps evolved? And if so, talk to me about that. Um, it has definitely, um, it's changed over the years. Maybe, uh, didn't quite in my younger years have the delivery, uh, the, the message was maybe coming from the heart, but maybe the tone or when I delivered it or how I delivered it, or even understanding people, you know, uh, you got to meet people where they're at. So you can't lead one person the same as the next. 
so having that kind of understanding of who you're leading also comes into um, play. But I think as as I've gotten older, I've just um, I've really learned to really take care of myself and make sure that I'm secure in what I'm doing and, and showing leadership through action and also just observing people. I think um, that's a big one for me is I'm a big ob- observer. I'm always uh, reading the room, uh, listening to what people are saying, hearing and feeling their emotions. Um, you know, as a coach, especially, uh, you got to be able to read the room and understand, uh, you know, if something's working or not. And you can't do that if you're not observing and you're not willing to humble yourself and really put everybody in the room before yourself. And, you know, um, being well planned, you know, I'm not a very good planner and, uh, it's been a, it's been a very refining, uh, season taking, uh, you know, for example, the community coaching job for the bullets that really refined me and in that sense of being well prepared. Um, and I think, you know, my leadership style has, has definitely evolved and changed a lot, but the most, the biggest way I think is maybe, um, recently, you know, just being able to have grace for people and not, uh, you know, having that being demanding when you need to be, um, and with who you need to be demanding with, but also understanding that, Hey, people are human. And, um, you know, if you just encourage them through their mistakes, I think that can be so much more beneficial than ever, you know, wiping a mistake in their face and, you know, uh, judging them for it, but instead just love them and, be there for them and, and, and uh, try to give your, your perspective on things and hopefully it helps them and inspires them to, to work just a tad bit harder. Yep, for sure. And I can only imagine, it's probably a good segue into the next issue I want to talk about and that's, um, you know, the world traveling uh, for you. You've, you've lived a, a life abroad and talk to me about, you know, integrating into Australia and obviously playing here but also living here and I guess the communication is probably different to where you grew up, um, if at all. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities in the States and Australia, the standard of living and, and all that sort of stuff is very similar. Uh, the basketball culture is uh, slightly different in a lot of ways. Um, and the leadership is, I, I believe it's not quite valued the same here. Um, as it is in the States. Um, and however, the reason being, I'm not, I'm not real sure, but, um, you know, it had, it was, it took me uh, a big adjustment, um, with the, I guess, coming to the state leagues where you only train twice a week, you know, the accountability isn't quite the same. Um, the passion and there's not, it's not quite as competitive, because obviously you're dealing, like in the States, you know, basketball is a, one of the big three sports. You know, here basketball is not quite as popular. So I don't know the statistics around all that. Um, but I would say that that has a lot to do uh, with the competitiveness in, uh, in the States versus here. But, um, you know, it's definitely the culture. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a whole lot different. Um because morality is still, you know, similar and, you know, there's good leadership here as well as the States, but I think just maybe that competitiveness, I had to learn to tame that a lot, especially playing in the state leagues. Cause you know, guys are going working at a bank, you know, <laughs> or working as a teacher and then trying to do two hours of training late at night, you know, after working a nine to five. So, um, and that's kind of how I learned that I had to meet people where they're at. And, you know, not everyone has the same desires or same amount of time that they're investing in the game. Um, but at the NBL level, certainly guys are held to a higher uh, standard and accountability because those guys are pros, um, all of them. So it's been it's been fun. It's been fun learning from the different leaders that I've had here and and learning the culture for sure. How have you gone adjusting to the slang? Because uh, one thing I didn't realize <laughs> until I moved away, was how many words we try and shorten, abbreviate, uh, and really colloquialize. How, how do you, how, how did that happen for you? Man, I don't know. When I first got here, I was walking down the street, and someone was like, you know, how you going? And I'm like, 
I'm going this way. You know what I mean? Like, what do you mean? How are you going? Like, what is that? It's like a mixture of how you're doing and where you're going. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it took me a while to adjust and learn it. Uh, I think it's kind of cool. You know, it's just, uh, it's unique. You know, it's the Aussie slang. It's what you guys, you know, um, are known for. And, you know, it's, uh, I think it's fun. You know, anytime you can have a, a bit of uh, cheekiness and, you know, poke, poke fun at, at your mate or whatever, you know, it's good. So I think uh, I've been here for on and off for about four or five years now. I think I've, um, I've learned a little bit of slang for sure. <laughs> love it. Love it. Um, I wanted to touch on, well, firstly, before I move on, uh, I wanted to touch on, have you observed some of the other codes and sports that we have here, uh, particularly rugby and Aussie rules? Yeah, the first time I watched AFL on TV, I was like, what is going on? I had no idea. They're kicking the ball. They're hitting it. They're tackling each other. The field is massive. I have no idea what's going on. Um, so that took that took me a bit more time. I had to ask some questions. You know, I had to, you know, ask my teammates, you know, why do you do that? Why is this happening? You know, that sort of thing. But, I mean, we just don't have the sport. You know, we don't have cricket. We don't have rugby. In the, in the states, well, we have rugby, but it's not it's not as popular, you know. So, really, it's baseball, football, American football, and basketball, and then hockey, you know, um, and all these other sports that you guys play. I just I, I had no idea um, the rules and and how how it goes. But I, I've learned over time. Obviously, the more you're around something, the more you get familiar familiar with it. So, I've. Uh, I've definitely um, learned a little bit about AFL and rugby and whatnot, but uh, I definitely still prefer basketball. Yeah. Have you have you got any teams that you particularly support, or is it just more you watch it from a distance? Yeah, just watching it from a distance. Give yeah. me a few more. Hey, don't don't push any teams on me just yet. No, no, no. no. Right, give me <laughs> give me a few more few more years in Australia. I'll I'll pick a team sooner or later. <laughs> I like it. Well, I, I must say, having watched the way you play ball, and um, obviously you're you're a strong point guard, crafty, good in traffic. I must say, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm the first person to tell you this. I'm sure I'm not, but you would make a pretty handy midfielder. Just having a look at the size of you, I've I've heard that from a few people. I've heard that. Um, you know, I definitely uh, would take you guys on on that. But I'm um, I'm a bit older now. I've had an ACL tear. I think I'm going to stick with basketball. It's been pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel you. I feel you. And I, yeah, obviously, do want to touch on the ACL. I didn't want to mention it early because um, very much like the attitude that you've displayed, not only with the ACL tear, but in, in any other challenge in your life, you've really never really dwelled on it. Um, we had a very brief conversation on Friday and it was just all business. And, you know, you talked a little bit about how this, you know, six to eight week block has been, you know, really a, a positive um, opportunity for you to get it right. Give us an update on the injury and, and give us an update on the whole rehabilitation. Yeah, I'm about uh, exactly now, about a year post um, tear. Uh, it's, it's going great. Like, I feel great. I can play right now. Um, and, you know, this isolation period has really given me a, an opportunity to be a full-time athlete again, um, which has been very, very good um, and very beneficial for, for, my, for my rehab and my overall confidence. Um, and, yeah, I, you know, pain is just temporary. You know, setbacks are temporary. I think that um, for me, uh, I've had a lot of injuries, so I have a bit of a different perspective, a rare and unique perspective, because I've had injuries in my past, you know, like in high school and college, that doctors told me I'd never bounce back from. So now I'm being told the same thing with my ACL, and I'm a bit older. I'm a father now, and priorities are priorities are a bit different. Value system is a bit um, has been a bit refined and shaped over the years, but. And I have no doubt that I'm going to get back on that court and I'm going to play at a high level. Um, it, it certainly doesn't come uh, without a lot of sacrifice and a lot of pain. And the, the ACL rehab has been challenging at times, you know. Um, but, you know, it's good. You know, it's making me better. Uh, I've had time to focus on maybe connecting with people more, training players more. I've had time to focus on um, and doing stuff like this, you know, and maybe – time to focus on different um, body parts that I've probably neglected over the past few years of my career. And I think, uh, you know, I certainly have an opportunity to come back stronger um, and even uh, come back better and more valuable and doing things mentally and maybe 
um, emotionally better than than ever before. So I'm excited. I really am. I think that um, these next few months, I'm just going to keep growing and getting better. And I'm really hoping that somebody uh, in the NBL gives me a chance to show that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know that that really that'll touch on the final theme, and and this is really the big one, and it's probably. It's probably one of the themes that I really it really resonates with me when I look through your career and your story, and um, just through when I read between the lines of the messages you're getting out there. It it all comes down to your mindset, and I wanted to dive deeper into that. What's your what's your spark, and where does it all? You jump out of bed, you do whatever you do every day. What is motivating you, and where does that come from? Well, for me, no doubt, it comes from my faith in God. Um, you know. My personal relationship with Jesus Christ uh, is my motivation because I know that his life is bigger than me. Basketball is much bigger than than me, um, and that's where the motivation comes from. That com- that comes from uh, you know the perspective comes from that decisions I make on a daily, how I connect with people, my actions, and my work ethic, uh, how I treat my wife, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. Everything is founded on my faith in Christ. So um, I understand that, you know, basketball, even as a professional, it's very short lived. You know, like I mentioned earlier, it might, it might, but your career after basketball, you know, the characteristics you learn, the discipline, the self control, the kindness, the love, the, the humility, the sacrifice, all those things you apply, you know, after basketball for another. Uh, 30, 40 years. That's that's kind of how I'm able to bounce back from injuries and told you know people telling me I'm not good enough. Coaches rejecting me. GMs passing up on me. Is I'm valued to God, so I know my worth. Just because one coach seeing my value, uh, it doesn't change my worth. Like my worth comes from my convictions, my beliefs, um, and that's where the motivation it really comes from. Yep. Absolutely. And do you find, yeah, uh, you, you did touch on that. Do you find the little personal challenges along the way? I mean, obviously you've got your core motivator, which is your faith. And obviously along the way, whether it's your competitive drive or whatnot, do you find yourself creating your own little personal challenges along the way to help spur the motivation? Yeah. I mean, anybody who says they don't i think that that's a lie you know i think we're all human and that's only natural you know that certain things uh certain rejection certain uh people criticizing you or being overly overly critical or doubting you they they, all that sort of stuff definitely plays a role um but the the main source of motivation i believe that's sustainable has to come from your inner convictions um, and then all the other stuff is kind of a byproduct of your inner convictions, you know, and, um, definitely, uh, you know, whatever it takes to get an edge, you know, um, I think Larry Bird was, uh, I heard him say in an interview once he used to psych himself out and say, you know, this person, you know, was saying bad things about him or hated him. Just so when he stepped on that court, he had that killer instinct and he wouldn't even think twice of just demolishing that guy, you know. And I think that's that's what you're called to do as a competitor. You know, you're on the court. I can uh, have that killer mentality on the court. And then after the game, you know, win or lose, I can shake somebody in the in the hand, look him in the eye and say congrats or, you know, you know, show them some love, ask them how their family's doing, you know, after the game or, you know, share the gospel with them. I can do that. I'm able to have that type of, uh, humility, but also when I'm on that court though, it's, it's, you gotta, you gotta be a dog. You gotta be a killer because somebody else is going to have a, uh, that killer instinct and, and you'll get, um, exposed if you don't have it. hundred percent. No, I totally, I totally relate to that. I, I recall my playing days, and uh, I was very well known at, uh, in, in practice as I was the guy that you hated to play against, but you loved to play with, and I made no apologies about that. And like you said, once that uh, final whistle blows or once that siren goes off, it's, it's, it's almost like you're a different person. It just You just shut it off. Um, I mm-hmm. learned that through just 
watching, observing, and uh, very much like you, um, all those heroes. My generation, I sort of grew up with, you know, Tracy McGrady. Um, I just missed out on the Jordan days, so that was a bit unfortunate. Um, but I do have plenty of tapes to go back and look look on. Um, but yeah, no, I really do resonate with that. Um, hey, listen, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been it's been great. Uh, I really appreciated diving into you and, and really, you know, learning about you as a person. And I'm sure those watching will resonate with that as well. And um, before I let you go, I, I do want to give you the opportunity to give, I guess, your passing message onto the world. And I know we've touched on it in this conversation, but um, if you want to maybe summarize your message to, to the people out there and, and what you're all about. Uh, first of all, thank you, Terry, for having me on here. It's been an honor. Uh, I really enjoy doing stuff like this. Anytime that, you know, you can connect with somebody and, uh, you know, really just share your journey is special. Uh, it's been a... It's been a very um, interesting ride uh, for me personally. A lot of a lot of uh, challenges along the way. A lot of um, you know pain, but a lot of uh, you know very memorable moments that um, you know I wouldn't take back for the world. So I think my message to people, um, and this is the one that I share quite often. I think um, time is the hottest commodity out there. It's the only thing that. Uh, you can't get more of, you know, everybody has the same amount. Um, you know, you can get your shoes stolen off your feet. You go buy some new shoes, you know, you can get your money taken out of your bank account. You know, you go work, you get, you make more money, but time is something you can't get back. So ultimately, uh, who and what you invest your time into shows what you care about. So I think for the young athletes out there aspiring to be a professional basketball player footy or rugby, whatever it is, um, you, you need to learn to invest your time into your craft uh, in a way that's not normal. <laughs> I'm not talking the normal, go to practice, doing what everybody else does. No, you have to be different. You got to get to practice early. You got to have the most energy during practice and you got to stay after and get extra reps. Um, there's a common theme with uh, excellence and players that play at the highest level and sustain that and become the greats is uh, that amount of time that they're willing to invest into their craft and what they're willing to sacrifice. I think the, the level of conviction you have will meet the level of sacrifice that you make for whatever it is that you're um, pursuing. You know, if it's sacrificing fast food, if it's sacrificing being uh, a partier and going out and being social, if it's sacrificing video games, whatever it is, you know, you got to make those necessary sacrifices and, uh, and it, it comes with a price. You know, if you want something in life, it definitely comes with a price. So you got to be willing to, to pay your dues um, and really invest your time into your convictions and what you're passionate about. And I think when you do that, um, ultimately, uh, you know, good things happen. For sure. Well, Jeremy, like I said, it's been a pleasure Best of luck with uh, recovery, although I think you are pretty much ready to go, as you said. Um, and obviously, best of luck with fatherhood. Uh, it's a fascinating journey that you're uh, obviously you've just entered, particularly with twins. Uh, you haven't really messed about. And uh, definitely yeah. need that luck for sure. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day, hey, mate. Th hey, thanks, Terry. Appreciate you, man.